Right, let's let's get started, please. Let me introduce my colleague and myself. This is Tomasz, a friend of mine. He does understand a few words of German, but we are taking this in English because his English is far superior. So he has US citizenship and there's a reason for that. Uh, my name is Gerald, this is Tomasz. We're going to tell you a few things about automated front-end testing today because the topic recently came up in our company and we had a discussion, we thought we'd share our insights and we'd be happy if you give us some feedback at the end how you are doing it in case you're facing the same problems. So I added the automated because I wasn't certain that it's uh, clear that it kind of needs to be automated. Let's dive into the agenda. It's a three minute motivation. Why do we do automated front end testing? Three minutes for choosing a tool. There are so many tools. How should we choose a tool? Which are the things that are most important? It's like the sole slide that has lots of words on it. Then we mention a few of the available tools, just some of them. And then most of the time, this half an hour is going into demos. We'll show you two tools in action before then taking some questions and that's essentially it. So motivation. Why should we do automated front-end testing? If I can give the question to the audience, who of you does automated front-end testing? Please, some more. One and a half-ish, uncertain. At least some of you do. Well, why do we do it? We need to deliver value to our customers. Customers generally do not value bugs. So we need to kind of test our software. Manual testing is an option. Automated testing is the other option. But it's absolutely required that we test our software. We have to try it out. Now, manual testing is, if there are any manual testers, then I'm very sorry for saying this, but manual testing is boring. It is really, really boring because every single release, you get to do the very same steps, click the same buttons, and so on. It's just not fun to do, and it doesn't scale. If you want to do agile software development, you release early and often. What does it mean? <laughs> you release maybe once a week, maybe a couple of times a week, which means that your software testers have to do the same amount of work every day, again, starting from zero, again and again and again. It's really, really boring, and if the software grows, you just can't have one or two or three testers. You need probably a 50 testers to be able to test the whole thing every day. So we really need automation. And it would also be good if we find bugs early. Why? The sooner you find a bug, the cheaper it usually is to correct it. So for us, that was enough motivation to get into the topic. And to end testing, why do I say this? I figured if I'm not saying it, you may think about unit testing. Unit testing are incredibly important as well. Unit testing, you can have thousands of unit tests running in a few nanoseconds, maybe milliseconds, and that should be done on each commit. A unit test tests a small function of code. The end user is happy if a small function does work, but the end user also wants the overall system to work correctly. And what we are showing you today here are tools for end-to-end -to -end testing, meaning we simulate a user that has a mouse, sits in front of a computer, and does one click after the other. Now, what do we want from a testing tool? Let's look at this. Number one, this is not just because I'm an open source freak. Open source is a super important criterion, because otherwise you lock yourself into a tool. You may never get away from that easily. Writing automated tests is not cheap. It's not something that you can do just like that. You can easily have a couple of person years wasted in doing something, and then the company goes bankrupt, or they are bought by another company. You may have heard of the fate of one local company here in Graz, and then probably you don't get any new releases. You don't get any bug fixes anymore in the testing software. Open source is important for that. It's also open source tools are very common and prevalent at universities if you want to have Students that have at least heard of your tool, you have a much higher chance if you go for the open source solution. Then, right next to open source and vendor independence is maintainability of tests. You are going to change your product. It's not, you might, and at what point you will, it's just a constant. It's the only constant is change. So you're changing your product. Now you have 10,000 automated tests which you've written over the last five years. What are you going to do? Why we can't change the product, we would have to manually change 10,000 tests. That'd be 
a horrific situation. Would you want to change 10,000 tests? Nobody would, no. Nobody Doesn't, would. It, it's as bad as manual testing, probably. So if we want tests, then we want the tests to adjust to changes in the product. So we want to have as many layers of abstractions as needed, so we can essentially adjust a change in the product at one point for the tests, and then they run. I'll try to show this in a simple demo. And the next thing is robustness against loading time. Why? If you're testing from a CI server, which is hosted in the cloud, and your own product is somewhere else in the cloud, and the connection is somewhat slow, if you anticipate a certain millisecond ping, then maybe your tests fail one day and the others, it, they don't fail. What does it mean if your tests occasionally fail? Occasionally failing tests essentially means you can throw away all of them. Because if they fail occasionally, you will not pay attention to failing tests anymore, sooner or later. And if you don't pay attention to failing tests, you can stop running them and they are just in vain. If you have a test, it should pass when the software is OK and it should fail otherwise. It shouldn't be fuzzy about this. Then there are a few more criteria. Tests can run against the backend directly. We're talking about front-end tests. Why do we want to run against the backend? Well, web front-ends usually have some kind of a backend. It may be a REST API, it may be AJAX, it may be anything else, but they have to usually communicate back and forth. Now, if I click on a button, I check that the button is clicked and looks differently, it's nice. But did the change that I just triggered really make it to the database? If I cannot make this check, then I can't really end-to-end -end test the system. Browser independence is kind of important as well. There are not too many browsers alive, unfortunately, but there is still Chromium, and there is Firefox, and there may be more. There's uh, Brave with a Chrome backend as well. You want to ideally be able to just, by the click of a button or adjustment in a YAML file, run the test against other browsers as well. OS independence is the same. How many OSs do we have? We have the big ones. So we've got Android, pretty big. We've got uh, iOS, pretty big. Probably also want to test a few new platforms. You've got the desktop operating systems. It would be nice if your test suit would cover all of this. Then acceptance test-driven development. This is kind of a knockout with the next one, ability to record tests. What does it mean? It means you have a product owner that says, I would like to have this feature. If the customer clicks on that button, I want the order to be immediately processed. The feature is not there. How are you going to write the test? Well, certain frameworks you can. Usually these have to be programmed, making assumptions that the button is there, and the test is going to fail, of course, before it's implemented. On the other hand side, if you want to record a test, it's usually not as easy to click on a button, literally, if it's not there. But both would be nice to have. A few more things. What about support? Is the tool that you're going to pick still supported? Does it have a community, or is it an open source project with a single committer that might die any day now? Is there good documentation? Is it easy to use and easy to learn? And is it written in a programming language? And are the tests written in a language that your employees understand and your colleagues? If it's JavaScript-based, most front-end people should know that. If it's Python, people can probably learn it. If it's written in BrainFuck, it's probably a bit harder. Can the tests run in parallel? I've mentioned these 10,000 tests. If you have thousands and thousands of tests, and end-to-end -end testing is somewhat slow because you really load the pages in a the browser, then things tend to get slow. If you can run them in parallel, you can just spawn a few new instances in the cloud and still, ideally, at least test on every push or a test daily as a very, very minimum. What about breakpoints? If you run in a problem, can you just halt the tests in the middle and start debugging to know what's going wrong? Integration with different CI systems, feedback and reporting capabilities. Does it spit out JUnit? Does it spit out anything else that's easily passable from Jenkins, from whatever CI you're using? So there are many questions that you can look into. And we prioritized essentially like this, and I'm sorry for that, and went for a couple of interesting tools. Now, which are the tools that we came across? Do you know any testing tools? Come on. Two of you said you do auto testing. Selenium is one of them, yes. Anything else? There are more, but Selenium is like the one that everybody knows. So we said, 
we investigate Selenium. It's well established, it has a huge community, it has solved many problems. Meaning, if people keep using a tool over a decade, then the problems they are running into have been solved over time. If a tool is out just last week, it may be really promising, but there may be things that you have to discover yourself and solve by yourself. So Selenium has a, a good advantage here. And programming language support is incredible. It doesn't matter if you do PHP or Java or Python. Selenium essentially has clients, <coughs> client code for everything. And Selenium remote controls your browser. So it's, it's a good approach. Then there's Puppeteer. Puppeteer is a bit unique in that it uh, uses the Chromium DevTof <coughs> DevTools protocol. So that's kind of special but it has the downside that is kind of pinned to Chromium because it uses the DevTools yes, protocol. Uh, Tomasz, which other tools are there which are modern and hip? Yeah, so basically um, the tools that you consider, there's so many tools out there that you can easily, easily get confused between all of them, but they basically break down into these two categories. There are tools that are, uh, as Gerald mentioned, Selenium, WebDriver, or even Puppeteer that run the browser from outside, or tools that somehow integrate with the browser and, and run things within the web page. Um, now, you know, there's obviously, I mean, Selenium has been around for so long, and it actually started, uh, the history of Selenium, if you go look at it, is actually a tool that started running in the web page. And then they moved out of the web page because they had too many problems with that. Um, but the next generation, or this generation of testing tools in, in JavaScript, um, sort of thinks that they can do better. Uh, using URL rewriting servers and processes that run concurrently with your web page that are also sandboxed within their web page. Um, and so um, Gerald is going to show you a Selenium based solution. I'm going to show you uh, a solution like the one I just talked about, Test Cafe. Um, of, the, of, the, of the ones that are uh, running concurrently in your browser, the two most popular at the time are Test Cafe and Cypress. Um, and uh, in, our, in our evaluation, um, in our evaluation, we included, of course, developers, because developers are going to be reading tests and, and probably writing a lot of tests, too. So it was important what they thought, too. And they were overwhelmingly more likely to, um, to pick these types of solutions. Because they work in JavaScript daily, I think that, that was part of it, too, even though you can get JavaScript drivers for um, Selenium. But the other part is, is the type of solutions that run concurrently in the browser tend to be much more simple to set up. Um, so it depends on what you already have, what you're already using, but uh, that's what we're going to be showing today and sort of discussing a little bit the differences and the things we've found so far. Uh, we're going to be showing Test Cafe because Test Cafe may, met um, a criteria that we also have that I'm not sure was mentioned, but we, oh no, it was mentioned, yeah. We need to run on a lot of different browsers and Cypress for the moment only, only supports Chrome and that sort of pushed things in the direction of Test Cafe. The two systems are very similar, um, at least from, from the 10,000 foot view. All right, let's dive right in. So I'm going to show you now a simple test, like super, super simple in Selenium, written in the most complex way you can think about. Why? To show you the layers of abstractions that are helpful. And then Tomas is showing you a very complex test written in the simplest way uh, possible to kind of uh, not explode the time that we're having. So let me switch the screens here for a moment. Up. That looks good. Let's run the test first. Of course, in a real life environment, you would not show the browser. So you would use a headless mode, which takes, let's say, 10% less time, less memory. But in the background, it runs. It's just not looking any impressive if I run this. And a few seconds later, it says done. So now you kind of see what's going on. It opens the browser, it logs in, it types some text, and then it clicks on a button. And now the button has been pressed, it closes the browser, and it says passed. That's a nice little test. So maybe I should show you the site so I can tell you what's actually going on here. Where is my site? Here we go. This is a site you've just seen. It's a time tracking software that we're testing here. It's a locked in user, and if I click the play button, it means the user starts working, which means that the clock starts to tick. This is the front end. On the back end, there should be a running task. 
So what I verify, I don't verify in the front end that the play button is not there anymore, that we have a stop button, but I verify that in the database on the back end, we now have a running time tracking. In order to be able to do this, I of course need some client code on, uh, on the back end side. So let's have a look. Number one, I wrote this really for discussion purpose. So this is not production code, but we can have a quick look here. What do I have? This is Python code. I'm not going to go into all the details. Some hard-coded things. One of them is configuration file. In that config file, I've got user credential, API secrets, and so on. Everything that I really couldn't show here and that I can't have in my version control either. So I separated that out. And the base test, this is Python unit test. I try to keep things simple. Uh, what do I do? I don't write the tests right as uh, child classes of test case, but I write a base class to do the whole login in one class, and then the tests are a separate class. So the actual base test doesn't have any tests. May come to some surprise, what does it do? The base test, it essentially starts the browser and makes a connection to the backend. So this time tag thingy is a tiny Python REST API, which I can use to control the backend. And here I read out the YAML config file, and then what I do is I open, a, in this case, a Chrome. It's hard-coded, but I can open uh, Firefox. doesn't change a thing. And then uh, as a teardown after every test, I'm just quitting the browser. And a few small functions. There's a special wait function that I'm using here and a TT wait. What does the TT wait do? It waits until the data has been propagated to the backend to make the tests more reliable. Why is that so important? Because on the front end, I immediately get feedback, and it switches from play to pause and so on. But sometimes the test is actually faster in connecting to the database than the front end is, and then the test fails every third time, every fifth time, whatever. It doesn't work. So what I need to do is I need to contact the back end and wait until the back end action is true with a certain timeout, which is large enough that it will never, ever be reached but short enough that for a failing test, we're not blocking the complete execution. And I'm using uh, the introspection capabilities of Python, so I add comparison is a callable, this pretty abstract, uh, aggregate is a callable, just some lambda functions I sent to be certain that the backend side is okay. And now let's look at a test. An actual test is looking like this, pretty small here, it's test start task. What do I do? First, I say, Dear time tech client, stop all current tasks so I can be certain that nothing is running. So this happens on the backend side. Now I count the number of running tasks on that server just in case, for whatever reason, somebody else has running tasks. It's not perfect, nobody else should touch my testing instance, but I'm still counting them. Now I'm opening a page. And this is kind of where the magic comes in. Login page needs to be defined, and this is a two-layer abstraction. <coughs> So the test doesn't know any detail about the login page. I'm just saying page.username, page.password, page.form.submit. I just logged in. And now I'm saying, dear Selenium, wait for the login to be done. And I'm opening another page, time tag page, which needs to be, again, defined. And I don't want the, test, uh, the page definition inside of the tests, because if the page changes, I would have to change my tests. I really don't want that. Now I'm going to say start previous task, which is click that previous task button, the play button, which you've just seen. And now we're waiting for the time tag back end to have one more running task than before. And in case that is fine, I'm asserting that we now have one more running task plus an error in case that's not true. All right, now where does this come from? Let's have a look at the login page because it's nice and simple. The login page essentially defines the function which I've used, or the properties that I've used. So this is some Python code. I define what happens when I access username or when I set username. So this is Python syntax. At username.setter means if somebody types username equals a value, then this function is called in Python. So here I say somebody is setting a username. And what I do is find element. And now 
comes the second layer of abstraction, I have no hard-coded uh, where is this element, some X path or get element by ID or whatever. I say login page locators, username input. So this is a small test with a lot of overhead, but the overhead I can use for all the other pages and tests as well. And this is the sole location where I am relying on the layout of the page. And in this location, I make an adjustment, and if I change the page, then it's going to be fine. So I'm going to show you these page locators. It's another file login page. It's really small here. You can see there's one folder called page model, which has the real accessors for the elements on the page, and the other one is the pages, which are already a first level of abstraction. So let's look into the login page. And here are my login page locators. The username input is accessed by ID, and this is the ID on the website. Password field is the same. These are pretty easy locators. And here I'm just using these locators. So I try to separate things out in three layers in total. I've got the test, I've got the page on the test, I've got the locators on the page. And if I do this, then I'm pretty stable against changes in the page. So I don't have to get stuck with any old page. Time tag is a bit nicer as a page. It has more things to do. The time tag page is start the previous task, start breaks, stop tasks. I can add more functionality to it. And here again, I've got these simple locators. Quick control start, break, stop, and a few more of these. The locators in this case are a bit more complex. Some of them are by class name, easy enough if I know that the class is unique. Some of them are beautiful X paths, X path for message box. If you know XPath, it's useful. If you don't know XPath, you Google it and you'll find your way. Uh, browsers usually support XPath, so you can just play around with XPath uh, right in your Chrome or Firefox console to test these. And they, the definitions of each element occurs in one place and one place only. So if for ever, whatever reason this log out no stop button on a message box is completely on a different location or the message box disappears or whatnot. I make the adjustment in one place and I'm fine to go. And it's not like I have to make that adjustment for hundreds of tests. And here are others, this is by ID. And that's essentially it for the Selenium side. And for running the tests, I simply used PyTest because it gives me this colorful output, and colorful output is impressive. And PyTest can do JUnit, so we can have that in, uh, in uh, essentially any CI system. And the last step for a second, the presentation you just saw, that's for Keith Andrews, who is the master of web-based presentations. We've got some markdown, which is what you've just seen. I'm going to switch over to Tomasz, who's going to show you a much more complex test with a lot less uh, abstraction, because otherwise you may get confused. Okay. So basically, I, uh, basically, when I was writing this test, I wanted to showcase maybe more of the framework than the levels of abstraction. Those are, those are really important, what Gerald went over. Uh, and of course, if you, were, if you were doing it for real, you would, ha you would have to do it that way. It wouldn't make sense to do it otherwise. Um, but uh, in these tests, I just want to highlight a little bit how the, how the framework works, and so that you guys can see with a minimum am amount of context what the framework is doing. Because a lot of the things that Gerald talked about um, uh, that he coded uh, some of the things, at least, not a lot of them, but some of them, the framework provides by itself, especially the weighting, and we're going to get into it. Before we get into it deeply, um, if you would just look at lines 13 to 20, that's the minimum amount. Can you highlight need. them? Yeah. Here. Can you explain the font? You know what, I think it's going to be difficult for me to do this in the middle of the presentation. I'm sorry. Um, but basically, I'll, I'll, I'll talk enough so that you can get the idea. Um, Basically, you need a fixture line that tells you what page to start on, and you need a line that says test. And this test takes the name of a test, and it takes a normal asynchronous JavaScript function. So those are the only things that you need to, uh, to define a test. This test would pass. Uh, here I also have one that fails. Um, and now I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you a, one of the tests that I have. Yeah. yeah. 
So immediately you can tell, if you look up in the URL line, you can see that it's putting a huge URL in front of your string. That's part of the technology. It's a URL rewriting server. Um, so it sort of makes its own backend in Node.js that you then communicate with to rewrite URLs. Um, and it also has its own component running directly in the, directly in the, in the web page called Hammerhead, in the case of Test Cafe. So we're going to the calendar. We're making a time tracking, trying to add a timestamp here, and just testing that everything works out fine. Um, so OK, so this is how the output looks like down here in the, in the bottom corner. Let me see if I can get this in the middle of the screen. Uh, so this is just one passing test. The dialogue interaction, fill in a, fill in a task. And we're going to look at how that looks, uh, or at least I'll talk you guys through it. Um, so it's down at the bottom. Uh, so you can see that here I put test.only in front of it. That means that I'm focusing on this test. I'm working on this test right now. If I take that only away, then it'll run every test in a file. So that's kind of just a convenience thing that you have if you're just developing one thing that you work on it. And we'll take it away later and run everything. Um, so uh, there's really, really no, I only abstracted one thing, which was logging in. Logging in, I wrote, I wrote a separate function because I needed it in every test. Everything else is kind of, kind of similar. Um, so we, we're using XPath. Uh, we're using selectors, and if you look down on this line, 145, um, you, can see the, you can see the basic idea. So the async function that you pass into your, into your test takes one parameter, and this parameter is the god object of the test. Um, what, what runs a test, clicks things, whatever you do, make assertions with it. And, uh, and that's what then is being used to click the selector. There is actually more going on in this line than, than, can, than is maybe obvious uh, from what's just on there. Um, for example, what this line does is there's a selector. The selector goes to the page. It automatically waits for a timeout, as Gerald did himself. The framework does in this case. Waits for, for a while that you can set. Um, if that selector is there or not, if it is, it returns it, and then it acts on that selector. In this case, it's clicking the selector. Um, the normal way that you're supposed to write it isn't as a bunch of await lines, but to chain it together like this. So um, the test I was showing was actually, so we make, a, we make a product that tracks time, if that isn't obvious by now. <laughs> and uh, one of the most important things for our users is that they can, I mean, the core functionality, one of the core functionalities of our apps is that you go to a calendar, you click and drag on that calendar, and it makes time tracking for you. Or it pops up that dialogue pre-filled with, with things in it for you to do. Um, so here, here you have functions for dragging. So first we drag. I, I know the state of my website, or at least I should know the state of my website. Maybe as we go on, I'll talk a little bit about isolation and why that's important from test to test. But in this case, I know that if we go from, uh, OK, yep. Uh, so here, um, if you're here, we're clicking on the 60th row. 60th row, if you see right there. And then in this case, there is an offset. So we're just dragging by an amount of pixels. You can also drag element to element. Um, but actually, I had problems with that. I'm also going to tell you the problems that I had with it, because it's not all roses. Even, even, with, even with any type of framework, it's not. And with this one, it isn't either. Um, and then you, you always, so you're always doing an action on a selector. That's the idea here. And so we're dragging grid rows nth 60 up there is a selector that selects the 60th grid row and drags it. And then you're doing an, uh, then you're expecting something. So you're expecting an add new timestamp button to exist in the dialog. The dialog will come up and it exists. You notice that there's no waiting here, there's no sleeping, nothing like that. But all this is being done behind the scenes. Uh, and it's actually being done uh, in a way that, in a way that I don't, I, don't, I can't really adequately describe it to you. It's very good that if you go read it, actually, on the Test Cafe site, they do some things with promises and some interesting stuff that's, that's beyond my level of JavaScript to understand. I'm, I'm sort of a newcomer to JavaScript. Um, OK, so uh, we're testing that we can add the new timestamp. So that's here. And we're testing that the cancel button exists. And there's two tests here that I commented out. And then here we're testing with XPath that the input exists, the input function exists, and then we're also typing in a test. And then we're, um, we're also typing in a text into the input, and then we're also clicking on, uh, clicking on a task. 
So if you wanted to debug this test, for example, something is going wrong, something is going wrong and this test is failing, and you want to debug it, the way that you do it is you put this uh, debug statement, hold on, read on mode here, you put this debug statement into you can kind of see the, the work that we're doing in the company. I'm the talker, he's the typer. <laughs> so you put in this debug, and I want to show you, and the, uh, I think one of, the, one of the things that's nice about these tools is how they do debugging. I think it's maybe the, maybe the one feature that you probably would have a little bit more trouble if you're rolling your own solution to do. Um, but maybe not also, it depends, I don't know. I, I mean, if you were doing this in Selenium, you would have to inject JavaScript anyway into the page and then trigger debugging there to do what this does by itself. So you end up writing your own uh, process like that in, in Selenium. Okay, so, so anyway, we, we're stopping here. At this point, we can see we have the add new timestamps dialog up here, and it has all the stuff in it. But now we're debugging. So it's stopped down here and it's debugging. And we can resume, we can unlock the page, and when you unlock the page, you can just go through it with all the standard tools that you're used to. So you can unlock the page, and then, uh, and then all, all, the, all the goodness of Chrome DevTools is there for you to debug your test with. And then you can resume or step through the test as you, as you wish. This is nothing that's special to Test Cafe. The other solutions also have similarly, similar things uh, with a similar level of polish. Um, okay, so we'll resume this test. Okay, so it failed because every time you're debugging, you actually have a test that fails. So we'll go here, turn this off again. And now I'm going to, I'm gonna turn this test on and we're gonna look at something more complex. So this test was, this test was uh, very simple. You go to a web page, you interact with the web page, you don't do anything else. So the important thing to remember, especially for those of you maybe who aren't involved so much in testing, is that no matter what kind of testing you do, you're always comparing what you're doing to a model. If you're doing manual testing, the model is in your head. If you're doing automated testing, the model is, if you're doing automated testing of this type, the model is in your code. If you're doing A-B testing, comparison testing, then the model is the previous thing that that you test it against. So A-B testing means that you run on a previous version and this version. So it's always, it's always a model. And in this case, we're having our models in code. So we're gonna look at something that maybe would be a little bit closer to testing, uh, w testing what we might test uh, for real here. So what this test does, or what it's gonna try to do, it's gonna fail, but uh, what this test does is it goes to the calendar and it tries to check that no matter where you click on the calendar, the correct times are pre-filled into the dialogues. Um, Tomas, why did you say it would fail? Oh, oh uh, I'll, go, I'll get to it because I, I, need, I want to show okay. failure too and, and how, how that looks because that's important and how also how it looks. Um, one of the, one, also one of the criteria while things are loading up, one of the criteria we also have is that we run in a mixed environment. So there's people, there as many developers using Linux, some using Windows, our customers of course use Windows um, uh, in the majority, and then we have people also using uh, Macs. So it's important also that the testing solution we have is sort of able to run across all those environments uh, and, and many different browsers, and this one does. So we're going through, we're testing, okay, we're at 2330, now, now it's waiting for an element to appear. Here it is, waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. I don't see it. I don't see it. And it fails. And this is what failure looks like, and it's important that failure looks good because <laughs> you'll see a lot of it if, uh, if uh, you're working on core functionality. So it first gives you a, a succinct message up at the top. Cannot in, in, obtain information about the node because a specified selector does not exist. So what this means is the selector that we were looking for didn't exist. Okay, and why didn't it, why didn't it exist? In this case, I've already done the debugging effort to uh, sort of figure out why it didn't exist. Um, and basically what happens is that when we get to hour 24, it tries to look for a time interval that isn't there anymore. Because after 24, the day should end. Okay. Um, 
that's fine. That's actually okay. So the test is miswritten in this case. But now we know that, and it's always very important to test these edges. The edges are or the edges are oftentimes are always where you're going to find the failure, uh, or not not always, but oftentimes where you're going to find the failure. Um, so that's how that looks. Um, let's see what else did I want to talk about here. Oh, yes, I wanted to show you guys, actually, XPath isn't av available in Test Cafe out of the box, which is something that shocked me at first when I, when I started using it. But you can only use CSS selectors. And a lot of people like CSS selectors more, and they're more popular, so that's OK. But there are some kinds of things that are e more easily done with XPath, and especially in the, in the uh, front end framework that we use, Sencha. It often constructs IDs out of two parts plus a number. And the number is sort of semi-random. It's not totally random, but, but it would be very brittle to encode that number into a test. Uh, so with XPath, you can, you can check in an ID that the front part exists. You can check that the back part exists, and then pick based on IDs. Um, and in order to do that, we, oh, I, we needed to write our own custom selector, or rather get the custom selector off the internet, because it's already written uh, by a member of actually their team. So let me just take a look at XPath selector to show you how this works. Now, this is, this is important because uh, one of the things that tripped me up as a newcomer to Node.js and Java was that uh, I was having a little bit of trouble keeping the context straight of what needed to be done where uh, in Node.js or, or in the browser. For those of you that are comfortable with JavaScript, that of course won't be a problem. But for those of you who are coming to these frameworks for the same time, it may be a bit of a surprise that there's two contexts that you have to think about. And the basic rule of thumb is, Keep everything in the Node.js context that you can. Try to do nothing in the browser. But with frameworks like Selenium, it's possible to do that 100%. With frameworks like, with frameworks like uh, Test Cafe, it's not. And uh, they provide very good ways for you to inject your code in a way that's, uh, that won't pollute the rest of the system. And the way they do that is by selectors. Selectors, as I mentioned before, they pull out an element for you to do an action on. Those are always run within the context of the web page. So here's, um, here's a simple selector that uh, does XPath. And you can see it's rel rel relatively trivial to write these things. Um, it just basically takes, uh, takes a value for the selector. It evaluates that value against the document and iterates over uh, the results and returns them. And so anything that you get returned from the XPath function in the browser, then you get for yourself too. And you can also write all sorts of custom selectors. And this is one good way also to, uh, with custom selectors, is one good way to ab abstract away a lot of, a lot of your difficulty. Um, because if you, uh, if you write your custom selectors uh, correctly, then your test becomes much more readable. Tests I have aren't, aren't really readable. You have to go in there and look at the XPath. But in this case, you know, if we had, in, in Gerald's case, he had a file with the XPath written. In our case, we would have a bunch of custom selectors, some using XPath, some using some combination of various things. Um, OK, thank you, guys. I hope that you, uh, I hope that you got some idea. It's, it's, a, it's a deep thing that we're still learning about, and we're still imp implementing at TimeTech. Um, all our 100,000 customers are, are going to be happy that we're doing this. I think things are, uh, us, us testers, uh, most of my work is manual testing. And we're certainly going to be happy. Um, and I hope that you guys uh, got something out of today's presentation. And if anybody has any questions, um, you know, please, uh, there's one over there and then one over there. That third one. What? Uh, maybe one, someone should explain to Tomas in Austria it's usual that we knock on the table oh, if we are okay. satisfied with what you said. Okay, so. good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Which uh, backend server do you test against? Do you spin up a new server with your current codes uh, during testing or do you have uh, one server? In this case, the test I was showing today was run against our staging environment, which is actually not, not a new server each time, but it's a new deployment each, each time if you want it to be. I was always. You see, in this test, one thing that I didn't have, we didn't have time to get to was actually making backend requests and logging them. I didn't show a test like that, if you guys noticed. Even the test cafe can do that. Um, and uh, we, we, uh, we can run, you know, usually when I'm doing testing as a QA, because I'm a QA, I usually do it as deployments that are made to stage, which is exactly like our production environment. But when our developers, we actually have some of our developers in here in the audience, when they're running, they run against local dockers. 
so we have a local Docker solution, and this is able to do both. Uh, didn't have time to show that today. Um, but yeah, uh, there are some differences. If, if that was where the question was going, <laughs> yeah, there, there are some differences that are, and, and, um, and we're still ironing that out because the, the environment should be exactly the same. But, you know, they're not. Test Cafe has a very useful option when you're debugging also to ignore JavaScript errors and just get through your tests so you can see what happens. And that, that comes in useful when you're working on something big and there's errors being triggered, but you want to focus on something small. It can help you, but still, it's not, it's not totally seamless yet because our environments aren't totally seamless. And just a short question uh, out of curiosity. Which uh, Grazer uh, company was bankrupted? Excuse do me? You know, do you know you, you uh, in the beginning, you it, it didn't, they were bought up. It was Ranorex. Uh, ah. They were bought up by a, uh, bought up. another international company, but we can talk ah, about that in private. Uh, yeah, question number two is over here. Yeah. Uh, just another question. Are there similar frameworks for classical GUI? Or is this only for uh, or something equivalent for GUI test for window based that's, applications? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, it, there there are there are uh, there is a in, on the Selenium side, for example, for Android, there is Appium, which is attempting to be a type of Selenium, mm -hmm. um, uh, and we uh, evaluated that because we we have. We're showing web, but we test Android, also iOS, Windows, and this. We have all, all four front ends. Um, and the, there's Appium, uh, and there's, I think, the ex uh, I think also a framework called Expresso or something that's built into Android for, um, for testing. And there's also, um, and there's also, uh, uh, there's also, there's, of course, there's frameworks for Xcode for iOS. Uh, iOS. That's just one framework that's, you know, they're one walled garden and that's their solution. And, but I think those frameworks are very, very different from these, especially in how they do matching. Like, I think it would be difficult. I mean, you couldn't write one test and, and put it to a different framework. I think they use, mostly use, do their matching in a, in a different way. So they use something called Hamcrest matchers, and I think ham, those have been, because um, really a lot, of, a, lot of what, a lot of the work that goes into this test is matching. You know, matching where you want to click matching where you want to put a text, a lot of the part is matching. And they use a different technology called Hamcrest matchers. They're not exactly like this, but they're similarly automated, at least. Okay. Uh, yeah. Thank you. No problem. Uh, uh, I think we can take one more question, and Tomas and I will wait outside to take more questions, but uh, I think we should switch to the next uh, talk so they have time to prepare. We have two more minutes, which means essentially a question, but very important. We are available via email, so if your question doesn't fit in now or for some reason you don't want to ask it in public, just shoot out an email and we'll stay here for at least 15 more minutes. And if you could evaluate our, our talk in pre-talks, we'd be pretty happy. So please use that opportunity. Okay, so everybody do that, what he said. <laughs> um, um, my question is, um, how do you deal with, or do you have the case of dealing with graphics generated in Canvas or WebGL and evaluating, okay. Uh, no, no, we... we uh, lucky you. <laughs> yeah, lucky us. I, I don't know. Uh, these frameworks are built to handle, to handle classic DOM elements mostly. Um, I, don't, I don't, I've never even, in, even when I was evaluating, I never even ran a case of somebody talking about testing that. So that's going to be really interesting for you. <laughs> You should write about it <laughs> and have a talk about it. Maybe next time we'll come. Uh, yeah, I think that would be pretty hard, yeah. All right, I guess uh, that's it for now. We'll be around. Thank you very much for your attention. And uh, see you later then.